Okay, we are on. So we will uh, wait uh, just a couple of minutes uh, to start officially here today. Uh, but uh, yeah, for the, those of you who have already joined, welcome. Um, for those of you who are um, back from, from yesterday, you also attended yesterday, uh, we will have a similar uh, show today. Uh, we have a new lineup, obviously. Um, and uh, we have uh, speakers from Elisa and Ile. We had a good show yesterday. It, was, uh, it went very well, I think. We had good feedback. We had uh, Google and, um, and Dplay uh, Discovery that uh, presented, as well as, uh, as we did a, a demo of the Viaplay service. And uh, yeah, it seems to be well received. We had a lot of uh, attendees. And uh, it looks like we will uh, hit the same number today as well. OK, so let's start. Um, welcome to the second session of the Nordic TV Week. Um, for those of you who are new uh, to this, so we are running this uh, series of uh, webinars, uh, online events uh, this week. We had a good session yesterday with uh, Google and uh, Dplay Discovery. And uh, today we have uh, another sh session with Elisa and Ile. And uh, tomorrow uh, will be the last day where we will run a one hour session as well in the afternoon. So my name is Espen, Espen Eriksta. I will be hosting this session uh, today uh, and tomorrow. Um, so what we will do, we will uh, introduce the, um, um, the speakers, uh, we'll hand it over to them and they will run their sessions. And after that, there will be a, a Q&A session. Uh, questions you will need to ask in the Q&A function in Zoom. So there's a, uh, there's a function there. If you go to the, to, to the menu on the, on the lower menu, there's a Q&A box there and you can type your question. Please do that uh, during the, the different sessions. Uh, yesterday we realized there were questions that were unanswered. We will try to answer the, the, the question that we, uh, that we don't um, uh, ask uh, loud. We will uh, answer them in writing. Um, we'll try to do that today. Okay, so I will uh, share my screen. Uh, so just quickly about uh, uh, tomorrow's um, agenda. So tomorrow we will have uh, Annika from SVT. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, clear speech. It's, um, uh, it's, it will be very interesting. It's something cool that they have done to, uh, to uh, improve the accessibility for uh, hearing impaired uh, persons. Uh, Adrian will do another uh, live demo of an, uh, of an app. Um, and then we have NRK that will going to that's going to talk about the visual identity of NRK and uh, kind of their uh, design process and uh, how they worked on 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 this and getting that out across all the different apps uh, that they have. Um, for today's agenda, we will start with uh, Tommy from uh, Elisa. So Elisa, for those who you don't know, it's, uh, it's a telco in, uh, in, in Finland. Uh, they're not only a telco, they're also a digital services company. They do a lot of things. Um, and uh, they have global operations uh, around Europe, around uh, Asia and APAC, uh, but headquartered in Finland. And they were actually founded in 1882, so been around. Tommy uh, Malameki, he is the head of consumer services uh, development in Elisa. Uh, he's been around for many years work, uh, working in the digital and software service uh, development. Um, in Elisa, he is working with the IPTV service, uh, uh, Elisa uh, Vida, uh, also the ebook service, uh, Elisa Kiria, and an international epic TV service. Uh, 
Tommy actually lives in, uh, in Berlin um, uh, today and where he operates all these different uh, services. So then I will hand it over to you, uh, Tommy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Espen, uh, for the introduction and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, uh, I don't operate those by myself. I have a quite extensive team that actually does a lot of the works and, uh, and, and so on. But um, I'll just briefly share my screen. Uh, if you wait for a minute or a second at least. Um, yeah, so um, first of all, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm today I'm going to talk about actually how how we can improve the, the customer experience uh, at the same time as we are actually reducing the costs and um, uh, as an example uh, i have the uh, our kind of cloud recording platform renewal project that we did um, this year uh, but before we, we jump in, I think it's good to just uh, introduce what Elisa Vihde is. So um, Elisa Vihde is a, is an IBT service in Finland. Uh, we have also streaming service, uh, which is called Elisa Vihde uh, ITO. Uh, we launched the service um, originally back in 2009. Uh, about two years ago, we announced that, uh, that we had already over 300,000 customers in, in Finland. We are available in all major platforms. And we have actually quite extensive um, uh, research and development team in, in Elisab. So, so the services, uh, majority of the services actually designed and developed by Elisab. Of course, we use uh, we have partners and, and, and we use third party software, but we kind of like to think that we are uh, behind of the driving wheel in, in, in our service. So when we are talking about NPVR as a, as a feature, um, it's, it's, it's kind of feature that, uh, that uh, enables customers to create recordings and, and watch them uh, whenever they want and wherever they want. And uh, about a year ago, we, we kind of decided that it's time for, for renewing our, our platform uh, in, the, in the NPVR area. And, and we kind of thought that, and, and started to think that what kind of platform we want to create. And, and we actually had several uh, kind of retro meetings with the team uh, discussing that what we should do and, and what we should not do. And, and we sort of decided to uh, stop investing uh, money on, on, on the storage. Uh, we also uh, kind of uh, decided that uh, we are not going to consume our time, our valuable time on, on, on actually managing the kind of the uh, server environment that, that is required by, by these kind of features. We also decided that we are not going to uh, uh, manually uh, fix the issues that, that are appearing in, in these kind of things, or at least uh, try to uh, reduce the, the amount of, of, of those manual fixes. And, and also, uh, we at back then we, we decided that uh, we don't want to kind of use uh, black boxes as as a part of the solution. And and by black box we mean that it's it's something uh, which is a software that we don't know what it's actually doing. We know what 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 is going in. And, and we know what is going out, but we don't know what is happening in the, in the box, so to say. And, and why is, is that we decide to do this is, or not to do it, uh, was that uh, if we want to improve the feature 
or if we want to kind of innovate new things top of that, that actually prevents because we are not knowing uh, what is happening in the, in the box. Uh, so what we kind of decided to start doing was actually going towards cloud native or being cloud native. Uh, we decided that, uh, that we are going to go uh, to a serverless mode, which actually means that all the kind of managing uh, the kind of server environment and, and those kind of things, uh, we don't, wouldn't need to do that anymore. So, so uh, I think that that came uh, along with the cloud decision, which was a, uh, obviously a good thing for us. Also, we decided that we are going to actually uh, store the content in, in object storage, which means that, that uh, we pay as we use. So pay based on the size that we use in the in the storage, and and since since we had a quite and still have uh, the extensive uh, user research team, uh, we decided to kind of the unit, utilize their insights on the customers, uh, since they are in constant dialogue with with our customers and they have also a lot of data that they analyze. So we kind of decided to, to utilize that and, and with the design thinking actually go towards the, kind of the new solution. Uh, we also decided to, to leverage uh, what we call machine learning uh, uh, in, in, in the MPVR solution as well. Um, we have already, and, and we have had a few years already different um, kind of solution where we actually use machine learning. Uh, for example, uh, we have a, uh, our own uh, content delivery network where we actually have utilized the machine learning and, and the results have been good. Uh, and, and, and so we decided to, to uh, continue with that track as well. So in, in the end, and in, in total, we kind of, um, uh, set us uh, for ourselves a challenge to kind of create a modern um, cloud recording platform that is actually based on the customer needs and, and based on data. And, and that actually what we, we implemented. And, and so, so the kind of the concept, the basic concept of the, of the implementation is, is actually quite simple. So, so we have, have the live stream uh, for, for each channel. Uh, then we have components that are running in the, in the cloud. And, and first component that we are, are, are using is, is the capturer, uh, which basically uh, kind of uh, analyzes the, the live stream that is ongoing and it builds and uh, captures five minute segments from the stream, which are then um, kind of um, validated by, by the viscerator, what we call viscerator. It stands from, or it comes from the, the uh, uh, from video streaming creator basically. So once that is, is processed, uh, uh, the capturer sends that, that uh, content uh, the kind of five minute segment to recorder, which actually stores that to, to, the, to the cloud storage or object storage. And, and at the same time, the, the viscerator actually uh, kind of analyzes the, the stream uh, more. It kind of detects certain objects uh, from the streams and, and, and generate metadata uh, from, from those. So that's basically the simply simple concept that we implemented, uh, and, and sort of the the benefits that we have seen so far is actually uh, let me just try this here. So benefits so far, what we have found is that that uh, we can actually detect uh, kind of the start time and and the end time of the programs. Uh, which are actual start time and end times. And uh, based on that, we can actually rewrite the EBG information on the fly. So time to time, some programs, especially sport events, they tend 
to some time uh, go longer than, than expected. So we can actually do this on, on the fly and detect this. Uh, also, um, we can uh, kind of detect other objects in the or from the stream. For example, uh, uh, if if the stream uh, or, or the TV program have actually subtitles in image format, we can detect those. Uh, we can kind of transform those to to uh, kind of text content that we can then utilize when we uh, kind of stream the recordings for, for the customers for, for different devices. So, so that's one of the kind of examples. We have less errors in the, in the, in the process, um, which actually then allows our, our developers to focus on, in, focusing on, on fine tuning the, the, the machine that we have built. Uh, everything is API driven, so the architecture is API driven. Uh, we have basically three uh, main uh, kind of API points uh, in, in, the, in the architecture. One is uh, listening to, to the stream, one is, is, is attached to, to EBT source, and third one is actually then um, allowing customer and devices to utilize the, 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 uh, the recordings. It's scalable in both directions, which means that if there's a lot of things happening in the, in the, in the programs or TV programs, uh, we can scale it up. And, and also when it's, it's more quiet time, we can scale it down. And, and everything can be automized and, and everything can be kind of uh, configured and, and, and set by uh, with the rules, business rules. And in, in total, uh, we have found and calculated that actually this, this kind of solution uh, saves over 30% in, in total costs compared to more like a traditional way of, of, of implementing or using or, or doing this kind of uh, PBR solutions. So uh, to wrap this up, uh, uh, we, as Elisa, we have been in the industry now for over 10 years uh, with the IBTV OTT uh, area. I think we, we know what we are doing and, and we have also decided internally that if someone else or some other companies are, are, are struggling with similar um, challenges that we have, uh, in, in this case, uh, we, we have decided that we are uh, allowing us to, to help uh, other companies as well. So if you have um, kind of similar challenges, please, please contact me and, uh, and, and uh, then we can continue the discussion and, and see if that's, uh, is there something that we can help with you guys. So. Thank you, and uh, back to you, Espen. Thanks a lot, uh, Tommy. Uh, thank you for that good overview. So we have a, a few questions coming in here. Um, uh, let's see here. So there's one question here. Uh, are you recording all the resolutions from the AVR stream? And how long is the DVR window you can record back? So um, yeah, so we uh, it, it depends on obviously on the on the on the channel. So there are various different um, uh, kind of um, bit rates that you can record. Uh, it's configurable. Uh, we can select those. Uh, but the kind of the idea is that we we uh, we just uh, store one format of the of the content. So we are not kind of having multiple versions. So we store the content once and, and that is then available for the, for the customer. And um, the, the window for, for the recordings, uh, it's actually legislated by, by, by the law. So it's, it's, there's a certain agreement in, in, in cloud recording uh, in Finland. And, and in Finland, it's, it's basically two years uh, whereas I know that, for example, in the in the Baltic countries, for example, 
it's it's varies a little bit it's based on on uh, kind of contracts um, uh, I also know that there are other countries in for example in Europe that actually allows the, the cult recordings but um, I don't know the kind of the specifics on on there but uh, in in Finland it's two years okay thanks for that uh, another question here what is the delay in this process? Uh, how long after the program is over will the uh, the program be will be available as a recording? Well, um, it actually uh, it's it's basically the recordings available immediately uh, for the customers, so there's no delay. Uh, and also the reason is that um, that actually we. Since we are taking those five minute segments uh, from the start of the program, we can actually um, prepare those five minutes already once the program is ongoing. So actually when the program has ended, uh, customers can immediately uh, watch the content or watch the recording. Uh, and also there's obviously possibility to have replay or rerun in the, in the origin server but that's not, not part of, of this solution. Hmm. Okay, let's have um, a final um, question here. Uh, what level of accuracy can you achieve with this, uh, with this system? Oh, it's a, I think that if you ask me that question, let's say in a, in a six months, uh, my answer will be different since the, the machine is, is learning all the time. Um, but, but also it, it varies uh, based on the things that you actually detect from the, from the uh, stream. So for example, the uh, subtitles, there we can actually uh, gain almost 100% almost accuracy. Whereas then the, for example, the program start and end times uh, there, it, there's more variation uh, depending on, for example, on the channel and, and also the content itself. But there, I would say that it's around 90% at the moment, but hopefully uh, it will be um, better in the future. But if we think from the kind of from the customer's perspective, I think that even 1% is better than, than the, the uh, uh, null or zero. So, so in, in that sense, every improvement is, a, is an improvement for customers. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Tommy, um, for a good session. We will move on in the program. Here. Um, so next up is, um, we're going to have a demo from, uh, from Adrian. So uh, Adrian, he will uh, show us the TV2 Sumo service. Um, so let me put up my slides. So uh, TV2 Sumo is, um, um, TV2 is a commercial broadcaster uh, here in Norway. Uh, and Sumo is their OTT uh, streaming service. It is an uh, SVOD service, but also contains a lot of uh, live and sports. It's owned by the TV2 group. Uh, so TV2 is the, yeah, the commercial broadcaster. Um, uh, and the, the, the service itself, it's, um, yeah, it runs on uh, a lot of different devices, all the kind of user uh, suspects of, uh, of the devices. Uh, we offer uh, movies, series, catch up, uh, they have sports, they have Premier League uh, rights, so there's a lot of football, for instance. Uh, they offer TVOD and they also have AVOD on their service, in addition to 13 uh, linear channels. And they package this in, uh, in five different uh, packages. So uh, then I will leave it over to uh, Adrian. So Adrian, for those of you that were not here yesterday, he is um, uh, one of our uh, project managers. So he's, um, he is, his, his life is basically to, uh, to test and use uh, OTT services. 
Norwegian Media, we develop uh, quite a few apps ourselves for uh, many customers here in uh, in the Nordics and Europe. And uh, as, as part of that work, we get across uh, a lot of these different apps and services. And uh, he will be running this, I think, on Apple TV today or uh, Tyson, but uh, he can answer that himself. Thank you for the introduction, Espen. Um, I'm coming to you live from our uh, test lounge, which has been recently converted into a studio for Nordic TV Week. Um, but uh, like, like Espen said, I'll be demoing the TV2 Sumo application on a Samsung Tizen device, similar to uh, the Viaplay demo yesterday. Um, TV2, uh, they provide content for the live content, SVOD content, as well as TVOD, T, sorry, TVOD content. So that's very similar to what we saw yesterday as well. I guess without further ado, we can get straight into the demo. Uh, so what we see here is this is the profiles page. So TV2 offer a personalization. So um, if you have, uh, let's say you have a household with, with many users um, and only the one account, you can actually differentiate between those, um, including a kid's profile. Um, and with that, we actually, they filter out non-children's content. So it makes it easier for parents who, uh, who want to have their kids who so can use the app, but they don't want them to find any of the, uh, let's say like the scary movies and stuff like that. Personally, uh, I would use the kids one because I hate horror movies. Um, so if we do that, we click the kids profile here, we can see we're straight in the kids section and we only have kids content. So now the kid is, uh, the children are free to use the application and they won't find any content that won't let them sleep at night. Um, then uh, if I just get out of this category here, actually, if I go back to the, the homepage and I'll actually get into uh, my profile um, and just bear with me one second, there we go. Um, so now what we have is it's my profile. It's, it's based on um, anything that I've watched before um, and none of the other profiles affect my, uh, the content that is driven here. Um, Yesterday, we touched upon uh, the term data driven. Uh, most applications these days are driven by the data that is supplied by the, the content owners. Um, and this is no different. Uh, as you can see, there's a continue watching row that's populated with all the content that I've watched recently. Um, and that just gives me ease of access. It's, it allows me to easier find what I want to watch and what I've watched before. Um, if I've sit, watched a series, the next episode will be in there. Um, and that just makes it a lot easier for me to, to discover content and watch the same content that I want to continue watching. Um, one thing that is different between like from a UI and user experience perspective for, for TV2 Sumo is the use of a category page. A lot of the time with other applications out there, you'll see that um, they have every single page mapped out in the menu. So you'll have a home page, you'll have a page for every single type of content, sports, news, et cetera. So, what TV2 have done is they've put that under one umbrella page called categories, and there we'll see sport, we'll see series, we'll see catch up content, films, um, and kids, etc. cetera. Um, I quite like that because having a very busy menu makes it very difficult to navigate, especially for these demos, trying to read something on the, on the screen, it's a, it's a bit uh, difficult. So this is quite nice. Um, also, when I use it at home, it's, it's a bit easier to navigate through it. It's, it's a lot easier to read these big letters especially considering that when you're watching a TV, you're sitting five meters away from it. You're not sitting right in front of it like it's a laptop, like it's a phone, you're not holding it in your hand, you're sitting away from it, trying to enjoy the experience. And this, and this adds to that. Um, if we go into the, for example, the sports section, one thing that I quite like about it is that it's got a different styling. So it immediately makes it jump out to you. It, it looks completely different. Um, and if you like, like live content, watching live content, and you don't want to wait for it, then um, what you have is you actually have a live row. And if you have to, happen to have to wait for it, then they have a countdown timer that tells you yeah, this sporting event is going to start in, the, in, what is that, three hours time now. And what I like about this as well is as soon as that live content starts, the player starts immediately. I don't have to press any more buttons. It continue. It just kicks off into the, into the program. I really like that. I can put, if I know a sporting event is coming on, I can put it on, let it play in the background, and then once kickoff starts, I'm ready there, I can watch it. I don't need to set any reminders or anything like that. Uh, additionally, like uh, Esmond was suggesting, they, they, offer, they offer live channels. So they also have a live section. Um, so that's the director page. Um, similar to what we saw yesterday, it's got the channels listed horizontally. And the only difference here is they only show the currently live program as well as the, the next upcoming program. 
I myself, I'm a millennial. I don't necessarily use EPG grids. I want, I, I want what I want and I want it now. Um, and that's exactly what this offers me. It tells me what's live now, what's next. If I don't see what I want to watch, then, I, then I'll go, go away, find something else, or I'll just come here. Um, additionally, on top of that, what they also offer is underneath the live player, it's direct access to the, that traditional EPG grid. Um, and then this will allow me to then sift through, find and to find more information about that program that I want that I might want to watch or something in the future. I can just scroll through as the content is playing. I can scroll through the EPG horizontally and find something to watch. Um, I quite that. As I said before, I don't really use an EPG grid, but if it's there, I can actually have something playing in the background, watch the content, and then I can still try and find it later on. Um, so that's that's an example of that there. Uh, additionally, um, another thing that uh, that we have here is with the if I go back to the live player, is we have the ability to to rewind through the live content. We have a DVR window. Um, which allows me to, if I want to watch this program from the start, I can rewind it and I can play it from the wrong button. If I go, I can rewind it and I can play that content from a different position. And then that way I can find it. I don't have to have any spoilers. I can just watch it from the beginning. Uh, if I then find that maybe I don't want to do that, I can then just go and press the live button and that will take me directly there. That's, that's quite nice. I very much like that. Um, like in most millennials, I'm fairly indecisive as well. So uh, that way I can just pick and choose, float around what I want to find. Lastly, the, the, other, thing, the, the other thing that makes TV2 Sumo unique uh, is the fact that they also have TVOD content. Uh, back to this categories page, we have the different types of content. And there we have the, the buy, like the shop section. What I, what I do like about this is they might not have a continue watching row, but they have a, a section of the movies that I have bought or I've rented. So this way I actually have a list of content so I don't have to start and sift through, find it again. I don't have to use a search functionality. It's right there at the top. And that way I can easily access that, go to the details page and then press play. What they have here is they have a start over functionality for VOD content. So like we suggested yesterday, we store a bookmark every time we, we leave the player and when we want to watch that content again, it will start from that position. If I don't want to, if I want to watch the movie again, then I can go press the start over button and then it will start from position zero. That is, that is a, I, that's a standard functionality that, that most streaming applications come with these days, but it's one of those things that we've become used to as an end user, as a consumer, and that's exactly what we want. That's what we pay subscription fees for. We want features that we expect and we want those to work well. Um, that's it for the demo. Um, TV Sumo is quite a nice app. I quite like it. And mainly because it's got a lot of Nordic content. So as someone who's trying to integrate into Norwegian society, learn the language, having an application that has a lot of good content and it's fun to watch. And it's also educational for, for the language. That's quite nice. So uh, back to you, Espen. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me on the questions and answers section at the bottom of the webinar. Thanks a lot, uh, Adrian. That was uh, that was good. Uh, we will uh, we are on a tight uh, schedule here, so uh, we will skip questions uh, for you, Adrian, um, and, and move on in the program. But what we'll do if you if you have questions, you just type it in the Q and A. Uh, we will answer them. Uh, Adrian can go in and answer uh, your questions if if you have any. I can see that Tommy is working on answering some of the questions from the previous session. Uh, but please type them uh, out and uh, we'll save some uh, some time here in the end to uh, to answer some more uh, live. Okay, so next up in the um, uh, in the show here today is uh, Kari from uh, ILA. So uh, Kari is going to talk about uh, some user engagement um, tools and services they have uh, made in uh, in Ule. I will go live here. So Ule is the is the public broadcaster in uh, in in Finland. Uh, we actually have all the public broadcasters here in uh, Norway, Sweden and and, and Finland uh, talking on the show. Um, and uh, Kari um, Kari Hokana is uh, he's he's a former journalist. But for the last six years, he's been um, uh, 
uh, responsible for the uh, for the streaming service of uh, ILA. It's called the uh, ILA Arena, and uh, and now he's uh, responsible for digital partnerships in uh, in ILA. So um, now I will hand over to you, uh, Kari. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Hopefully you can. Yes. Great. I hear and see you. Great. So uh, I will not be talking. Can you see my screen? Yes. I hope so. Yes. Uh, I will not be talking about the OTT service we have, uh, which we do have. We've been having it for 12 or 13 years, actually. And it's one of the few, if not the only, uh, OTT VOD service that is more popular than Netflix. Uh, and um, we are quite proud of that. But rather, I will be talking about our chat tool, uh, which uh, we piloted uh, last year, and which complements the uh, streaming service and also the uh, television, live television service. So, uh, Basically, uh, the chat tool uh, was la launched as a pilot for the documentary series called Documentures that we have been running for quite many years. The um, idea of Documentures is, is pretty simple. They, um, for each season, they have a theme and they have different documentaries. Documentaries are made for the series. They are independent uh, documentaries that we bought and they are then presented and, uh, and shown the, the uh, documentary, and then they are having a kind of a quite informal panel discussion about the, about the movies. And uh, from, from the start, the documentaries has been quite interactive show. Uh, the interaction so far was uh, mostly in, in Twitter and with SMS messages. Uh, so, but there was a clear need for kind of a second screen, second screen solution. Uh, and, and for that, uh, the Wiley chat uh, was created. Of course, there was other needs for that kind of a tool. And since the pilot, uh, Wiley has been using the chat for various um, programs. Uh, I think the, uh, COVID-19, um, when it started and when the, the first wave started, the chat was also used for the news bulletins and people could ask questions in the in special news bulletins. Uh, and the, the basic idea of the chat is that you can vote, you can comment, you can you can react to other, other users' messages and um, yeah, to make the, the uh, show more interactive. So, and we have the uh, Wiley, Wiley's own login system that you can use. If you don't want to log in, you can still uh, watch the, the chat, but you can't participate in it. But when you log in, then you can you can chat. The leftmost screen is is the chat window, and the second from the left is kind of a reaction window. You can send hearts or whatever in in the chat. And the third uh, view is the uh, is the votes screen. The editorial people can present different kind of questions or polls for the for the users. And then on the rightmost uh, window, you can see the, the chat window where the editorial uh, people that are participating are, are having a different color in the, in the chat as compared to uh, people that are viewing the show. So you can comment, you can vote, and you can react. And this is how it looks in the actual show. Uh, the, as I said, in the in the first phase, the chat was uh, really a one um, web page where you can go and then participate in the chat, and you can see the chat behind the hosts in the in the picture, rolling there. 
And what we were trying to achieve with the with the pilot was, as I said, to give the audience uh, the possibility to interact with the with the broadcast and also interact with each other. So, uh, and and one of the goals was to have the uh, discussion on our own platform that we wouldn't be. Um, we wouldn't be needing outside companies or outside uh, services for the interaction. And, uh, and one reason for that, again, was to have a better discussion, the discussion that would be more like the quality that people are expecting from the public broadcaster. And, uh, and also on the numerical side, we, we thought that the chat service would be one way to create more uh, or login uh, users to know that, to give them a reason to log in with Uletunus. So, uh, so that we would be able to drive the adoption of, of login and also better cooperation inside the company. Uh, what did we achieve on the on the numerical side was was pretty good. The uh, as you can see, the um, demographic is is bang on what we were looking for, because that's exactly the the kind of the people or kind of demographic that that are hard to achieve for the public broadcaster. We got quite a lot uh, new users for the Ula login and. Uh, and quite a lot of messages, uh, especially for the Eurovision chat. Well, that isn't hardly in news for any any public broadcaster that that creates lots of people, uh, lots of attention, and and also in our case, uh, lots of interaction, lots of messages, and uh, quite lively comments on the on the pilot on the uh, doc ventures. And apart from the from the numerical side, I think the main achievement was to to create really interactive uh, formats and 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 to have sort of a hotline in the studio. Uh, and the users were were really kind of forming a community around the the program and around the uh, documentaries. And we achieved moving uh, the conversation and users from Twitter to uh, YLE's platform, which I think is uh, quite a good achievement. So it, it shows that um, we can compete in a sense with the, with the commercial social media companies. Also, the level of discussion uh, was, was quite good. It was better in our opinion and, and also in the opinion of the users. It was a better discussion than you could probably normally find on, on Twitter on any subject. Uh, and, the, and the pilot was successful in a sense that the um, tool is, is now uh, used by in, inside the company by, by many different kind of uh, products and, and live events. I already mentioned the, the new show and the, and the COVID-19 coverage and the news bulletins that the uh, chat was used. And that was really a stress test because it's, uh, um, this was quite serious business and, and people had huge need for information and the chat tool seemed to be working towards that end quite well. And that's the kind of a high level architecture. I'm not overly technical person, so please don't ask me uh, too hard questions about how the identity API actually works. But the basic idea is that the, the chat is an API based uh, service, and we can use the service in, in, different, um, in different places, in different services. And what we have done is, is to integrate the chat into the mobile uh, streaming applications. So one thing that we are, are currently doing or the team is currently doing is is to 
productize the the chat so that the when we have a live show where the editorial people want to use the chats the editorial people could easily turn the chat on if they need if they see that the chat is needed on this this production uh, at the moment it still uh, needs some small amount of of developer work but the point would be that it wouldn't need any of that so it would be uh, quite clearly an editorial thing to do. Okay, that's my part. And I think I I was quicker than I was supposed to be. So at least I won't be keeping you from getting out from the seminar. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kari. Uh, that, was, uh, that was great. Uh, we have uh, a few questions. And uh, yeah, since we finished a bit early, we will have uh, time for this. Uh, first one uh, out here is, um, is this uh, Illet chat service uh, available via HB, HBB TV? No, we don't currently use HBB TV. This is uh, something that is available on the, on the mobile applications and on the web service of the, of the Ule Arena uh, service and on, on the independent um, HTML page, but no, not in the HBB TV because HBB TV adaption and the use, especially in the Wiley, is quite limited at the moment. Okay. But it could, I would say that it would be quite easy if, if the HBB TV was something that we used to, to then that could be quite easily integrated. Yeah. Okay, so another question here uh, How do you ensure? quality of the conversation the chat are you are you doing like moderating of uh, of the chat then yeah uh, in in the in the case of uh, documentaries all the messages were pre-moderated and in the case of uh, documentaries i think one third of the messages were uh, were not shown on the chat uh, window and two thirds were shown so and I would guess that also depends on the kind of uh, contents and kind of uh, uh, program that you are using the chat with, whether whether the discussion is, is easy to moderate, whether it, it requires a lot of work or a lot of people to moderate. But I think on the, on the doc ventures, the number of moderators was something like two or three for sure. Mm, okay. Uh, another question here. So it seems you are doing the uh, are using the browser for this service. Uh, and why did you decide that opposed for using an, an dedicated app? Well, um, I think the the main reason was that it was easy to develop the the pilot for for the web page. And as I said, we've already integrated the, the possibility of using the chat inside the mobile um, streaming application that we have. But, uh, but that was the quickest way to develop uh, the pilot for the, for the show. Mm. And as this is only a, a pilot now, so, say, well, so where do you see this going from here? Do you think this will be a, like an integrated part of your uh, um, Wiley service, or I think so. Uh, I think the pilot and and the the programs that we use the chat with after the pilot pretty clearly demonstrates that there's a need for this kind of a service, and there's uh, there's an interest from the from the users. Uh, so the uh, development of of the chat tool is is ongoing, and it's going to be used in. In different shows and also in different uh, applications that we have in the Wiley. Mm. Okay, and uh, let's see, there's a final question here. Um, comment and question. The demo is fascinating. Do you think customers find your service more attractive because of that chat feature? I've not studied Route 2 recently, but I would be curious about some comparison. Um. I think um, the chat itself doesn't really do anything. I, I think the 
it's the same thing as as with any programming that you have to have a clear role for the chat and and you have to have i don't know a call to action and and you have to have uh, integration with the with the development of the content when you are using the chat so so you can't just slap on the on the chat and hope that something happens you have to you have to plan what you are going to do with the chat and what the role of the chat is with the with the content concept that you have. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Kari, uh, you. for your uh, time and uh, preparations here. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so that uh, now we are getting towards the the end of the show uh we're getting quite a few questions about uh the recordings of this show so we are doing recordings of all the sessions uh we are targeting to uh, to publish them on the uh, northern web uh website uh, but we will follow up with uh, email communications on all the signups uh, regarding this when and if they will be available so um, be with us um, on that uh, so for the final uh, point here today, I will hand over the um, uh, the word to Ajay, Ajay Anand, that's the CEO of uh, Norwegian Media. He's also been uh, the overseeing all these uh, Northern Wave initiatives uh, that we have. So he will give the, the, the final remark uh, today. Thank you very much for that, um, Espen, and thank you extremely and a very huge thanks to our speakers, both Kari and Tommy. It's not the easiest for us uh, to get the, the Finnish colleagues on board. Uh, we've got a brilliant insight into what's going on in Finland, a uh, big part of what the Nordic TV aspects are. Of course, I have always said that Nordics is the, is the center of it all in terms of streaming, simply because of the networks, because of the buying power, the, the content availability, both local in each country, as well as international content, where subtitles is extremely important because people can understand English as well as consume local content. We also have had Ila, who's a part of today's show, and tomorrow will be our last show for the Nordic TV Week, where we'll have NRK and SVT from Norway and Sweden, the public broadcasters in this region, which is so publicly social and so publicly fantastic. It's important for us to realize that the TV that we get from the government is probably better than the international giants. Stay tuned and see how, how as much as we've seen the interactivity from ELA today, we'll see how the visual aspects of NRK is defined tomorrow, as well as the accessibility from SVT, because when you make public TV accessible, it needs to be accessible to just about everybody that there is within the industry. Northern Waves, as Espen said, we, we've, we've started this a few years ago, and the reason is that, that we want to make this industry available to pretty much everyone who's a part of it. You and I have day jobs. Conferencing is certainly not my day job, and I think that we want to do this to make us have fun, get to know things as well as increase our knowledge and make a community where both business people as well as technology people can join to become one. The idea here is that if you have any questions at all, please feel free. The website is www.northernwaves.tv or info at northernwaves.tv for us to be able to create any form of content that you will be a part of. Thank you for your time. We'll see you tomorrow at um, 2 p.m. Norwegian time, 1 p.m. UK time, that's 9 a.m. in New York. We've had people sign in from Australia and Argentina and America as well as all over Europe today. It's been brilliant. Uh, we've seen a lot of questions in case we've not able to uh, not been able to answer any questions. We will get back in touch with you on email. If you have anything else, I'd like to thank my colleagues Espen and Adrian for being absolute superstars today, as well as Steph for organizing all of this. See you tomorrow at two o'clock Oslo time. See you.